Good morning. Actually, today it's good afternoon. Today is October 16th, 2023, the year of our Lord. And today is Monday. Hallelujah. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now on our knees inside. Lord, enable us to lay hold, to grab hold with ferocity truths that you share, that they won't escape us, that they won't be lost, that we'll take them to heart and hold them true. Thank you, Lord, for your gifts are many and beyond describing. Lord, enable us to be good children in every way and to lay aside all those things which easily, as our brother Paul said, so easily beset us. All of the weights and hindrances of the world in which we were birthed. So many traps and hindrances. Help us to set these aside and continue on toward the prize. The fullness of you, Lord, the understanding and the wisdom Enable us to lay hold of this, Lord, that we not miss a morsel of it. Oh, I come against every evil spirit who would stand at the gate of the ears and the hearts of anybody listening to keep the truth out. And we cast you away and we speak strength to the pathways of truth to the hearts of each person listening. No hindrance from hell can stop it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your saving grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Meditations of my heart all week on so many things, so many things. The Lord involves himself or has constructed in this place where we are, this world system where we are in but not of, we're told in the scripture, and we know it's true because of how we are in it, those of us who are saved and set apart. We look at it with a great deal of dismay and we see more and more contrasts as we are in this system. The contrasts become more and more evident. Initially, before you're saved, you don't, you don't see the contrasts between God and the world, uh, hardly at all. They don't catch your attention. Now they do. Now you see them. And in large part, are dismayed by the contrast that's on the side of darkness. And because it's all over the place. You don't want to step into it. You don't want to fellowship with it because you can't, actually. Well, you can try, but you shouldn't. You don't want to bond yourself or get attached to the things of darkness or to the people of darkness. We have a mission, in a sense, to the people of darkness, and that's to share the light. But that's all. You're not to fellowship, you're not to become part of, you're not to become friends with darkness or the people involved in it. But we are to share what we've been given to share, and this is an incredible mechanism that God has given us. God pays the price 
and obtains the product that we are given for free but costs our entire self to obtain. Oh, we can have it and we can have it but we're going to pay a price for it. What is the price? It's what you think you have. That's what you're going to pay the price with. What you think you have. In order to get what you can really have. And then his mechanism for dispensing his product are the ones who have bought it and paid the price. And we are his delivery system. It's kind of incredible actually. <laughs> God's multiplication and that's the truth. The multiplication in the kingdom of heaven which rides right alongside and is involved with the world but not of the world the kingdom of heaven so we are first as I've mentioned many times and I will many times again I have a sweet person in my life that when I repeat things very clearly tells me but you've already said that Yes, I understand. And I will say it again. And that's what I tell him. I said, yes, you've heard me say that. And I will probably say it again. And again, you'll probably hear it many more times. We're to seek first the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And those are two things that most people, even those who profess the name of Christ, don't actually understand what either of them are. They don't actually understand what the kingdom of heaven is. That's why we are to seek first. And they don't actually understand what the righteousness of God is. Now in some circles, you're taught that you are the righteousness of God. And that's the truth. But we don't understand that. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll know that we don't actually understand that. The righteousness of God is something that escapes us. It's very hard to get what that is. So you have to study who He is. And you must ask questions. And that I've also said many, many times. Questions will make you smarter if you listen to God's answers. So questions are vital. Questions make you think. Jesus often asked questions. Some of the questions that he asked didn't seem to go with what the people around him thought they were asking. He answered their heart with a question that they needed to answer in order to see their own heart. Because above all things, the heart is the prize and God wants it. So does the enemy. So God births us into this incredible construct and he's provided a way like a vine whereby births are creating births, are creating births, are creating births. None of it's done with human hands, but there's a human involvement. Very unlike the angels. The angels are created one by one. Then, God offers man an incredible covenant, unlike any covenant that's ever been before. Never been one like it, ever. He says, You believe on my son, and you can be my son. In the first chapter of the book of John, 
he says, and for those who not by a physical urge or a physical act have been born of him. He is now our Father. Then we have the right to become a child of God. We have the right. To those who owe their birth, not to a physical urge, not to a physical act. In other words, outside of this mechanism whereby God has arranged the births of many people into this place uh, of the world. Well, that's another birth. They owe their birth to God. Those of us who, God is our Father, that needs to be thought about. It needs to be meditated on. It needs to be pondered. It needs to be chewed inside your heart. Think, 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 think on that one. God is your Father. That'll set you free in many ways. It'll show you that God gave you an earthly dad in order to demonstrate who God was by giving us a type. It can set you free from a bad family, from a bad dad. It can set you free because God is your father and he's the only one that you're to call father. It can set you free to understand that you have a family now and it's vast with many siblings and many mothers. that you've never met. But if you have need and you call upon God, it's amazing how many of those other brethren will surface. Sometimes not for a very long time. Sometimes only for a few moments. Maybe it'll be in a hospital setting when you're panicking and God will send someone in that you'd never seen before. And that person will give you words of comfort. And you know this is a brother or a sister. And then they leave and you don't see them again. <laughs> family. Now that's family. That's family according to the kingdom of heaven. Family according to the kingdom of God because they are there. They are all over the place. God has many means to come to our aid. He uses the brethren, the family. He uses angels at his will, not ours. That's important to keep that one in mind. There's a lot of uh, hinky teaching out there about how to command your personal angel, etc. Like you need to develop and grow in that skill, which you do not. It's not a skill you were given because it isn't a task you were appropriated because it is God who is Lord of the host of heaven, not you. Well, that will come as a surprise to a great many people. So we don't want to waste our time on that. It is akin to angel worship. Okay, these are entities that are God's and not ours ever. You don't take possession of an angel. You do not have authority over an angel. Angels in everything that I read in scripture are sent at God's behest to do a task. And they are sent many times on behalf of the children of God. But they are an entirely different class of being, a different order of creation. Wonderful, incredible but different and under the same master that we are under, God the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so God enjoys contrasts. He enjoys darkness and light, and then he separates them. He enjoys everything about what he has made has pleased him to do it this way. It's pleased him to do it. That's why it was done. In order to gain understanding and depth of heart and an ability to hear him better in areas that we all need to hear him better in, to go deeper and deeper into him, we have to spend time pondering his contrasts and we have to spend time studying what we have been given in order to learn of him. Now the scriptures are a, definitely a gift from God and we can learn that way and the contrasts he highlights throughout the entire book, the contrast between good and evil, the contrast between life and death, now there's a huge contrast between the kingdom of God and the world. Kingdom of God operates on an entirely different system. It operates by God's righteousness, His justice. Righteousness involves God's justice and His mercy. It is all these things. And the foundation of it is exactly what God says He is. He says he is love. Now a lot of us will get all kinds of goosey feelings and we'll say, oh, we know what love is. Oh, yes, love makes us feel so good. Well, not always. Many times the love of God is wrapped up in his discipline and in his punishments and in his wrath. It's a contrast, and God is showing us something about himself. Our God is a God of contrasts in many ways, and they are both yes. God presents us with situations that enable us to make a decision, and he wants us to decide for him. He makes it terrible sometimes, or permits terrible sometimes, so that you will turn your attention to Him. And you might say to yourself, well, I happen to know that you can catch more things with honey than you can with being nasty. God says, I want your heart, and it may take nasty to get there. And that's the truth. How nasty? does it have to get in your life before you're willing to reach out to God? How to the end of your own decisions and means do you have to get before you're finally willing to say yes to God? And is that a one-time yes? Because you see, that's fascinating to me. People will become destitute, reach out to God, and then that's it. Things change for a while, and then they slide back into where they were. Why? What happened? What kind of a God would allow this? The same kind of a God that is trying to get your attention again, because you weren't to let go. You weren't to think in the flesh, I got this, I got this one, I'm good now. Oh, I had that great experience, and I'll tell you, I'm going to remember that for the whole of my life, but I got this now. I know what to do now. No, you don't. You've only just begun to learn of Him. Now you have to learn how to hold fast to Him. So you go along, and it gets, it's okay for a little while, and then it gets real bad again. 
And then you're down on your knees and you're crying out to God again and he loves you. He reaches out. He, I've called my son or my daughter to me and they're with me now, with me now. And then, well, they got this and they take off again. He wants you to stay there with him. Well, that's painful and it's uncomfortable because after all, I, I, I'm going to be, I'm going to feel, uh, you know, uh, I won't be able to feel confident in myself and I won't be able to feel like I've got this okay and I won't be able to go back and do the stuff I was doing before and that's good. You're not supposed to. And yeah, you're going to feel uncomfortable for a long time. And that's okay. That's okay. So get used to it. And you really should get used to it. It's going to take a while before you learn to exchange what's in you for what's in him. That is a time intensive exchange. Much talking to God. Much crying out to God. Much reading of his word. You have to get that into you. And then, after a time, the peace of God begins to come over you. And much of what's been keeping you in turmoil begins to lay flat. That yeast from the world, which is constantly fomenting, begins to lay flat. And you begin to not say, I've got this, but to say, God's got this. And now he's not having to grab your little hand and put it in his own so repeatedly. Now you're reaching out every single day, many times a day. Now he can work with you you're beginning to become trustworthy. Oh yeah, God needs to have you trustworthy. And most people are not. Most children, most children of God, children of God, most of those who call themselves children of God are not trustworthy. How untrustworthy do you have to be before you're not a child of God anymore? Well, these are all questions that I've allowed myself to ponder for which I'd have no clear answer, and I don't believe anyone does. But it's as I have mentioned before, you don't want to know how far you can go and still be considered his. You don't. How about you just dispense with that one at all? That's the flesh enticing you back. Okay, so the contrast. Kingdom of heaven versus the world. So he births us into the world. But I believe he doesn't birth us into this world with nothing. He births us into the world with something that he's put inside of us. And I believe that in large part, the children of God remember something about way before when they were very little. I believe that's in the heart of most children of God. He's watching over his own, even when you don't know you're his. He's paying attention. He's watching over. He's protecting. And he's doing what's right for us. And that we have to believe because it's true. Because he's not a man that he would lie. And he's told us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. <laughs> Even unto the ends of the earth. Praise be to God. So, this place, the kingdom of God. Jesus, when he walked the earth, he said to many people, the kingdom of God has come near you because it was coming through him and what he had done for them 
brought it right there. But see, those people weren't in it. They weren't in the kingdom of God. The actual establishing of the kingdom of God as dominant has not actually occurred yet. But the promise of it and the truth of it and the price paid for it has already been done. And that was done on the cross. So we are bringing the kingdom of God near to those we minister to. We bring it near to those we bring healing to. We deliver God's healing to people. We deliver God's love to people. We deliver God's deliverance to people. We deliver those things that God gave us to give by His Spirit to a lost and dying world. And they don't know they're dying. They think they look pretty good. And quite frankly, some of them do, I would say. There's going to be a lot of people that look pretty good in hell. But there's nobody who cares about how you look in hell. There's none of that. Because there's no caring in hell. That's where hatred and greed and jealousy all go. They all go there. And the people who have agreed with those emotions and held those emotions in their heart and produced what those emotions have to produce in their lives, they all go to hell. So we have a big cleanup here. And uh, there's a great deal of sanitizing that has to go on in our hearts, but not by pretend. This has to be real. You have to really get these things dealt with, or it doesn't count to God. See, God isn't fooled by appearances. And we are told in Scripture, Jesus didn't judge by what he saw. Well, he was judging by the Spirit of God in him who knew the truth, and he knew the truth. He knew the truth. He knew what their thoughts were. He knew what their thoughts were. He knew who the evil ones were, and he knew who the children were. He knew. Praise be to God. God has a memorial, kind of like, you know, football has a hall of fame. Well, God has a memorial for his stars. And they are ever observable, just like stars are. When we look out at the sky, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, people mapped the skies. And the skies are pretty similar now to how they were then. The stars are still in their position. I say every now and then I have heard that, that we lose one. But they tend to stay fixed for us. While they may shift in the atmosphere of the heavens, their basic location in relation to each other stays just about the same. And the seasons reveal different manifestations of different constellations as it goes around, as we go around in our trajectory. God has stars. He has memorials that he has positioned. Now those memorials that he has positioned are in the word of truth, the scriptures. And we've got quite a few of them. People that we've been talking about for hundreds of years now. So it's the Bible record alone. And God's got his own way of doing this. I believe that's one memorial but he has many. Years ago, the revelation came to me whereby I saw that you become like what you worship. 
Now I saw this, I can't say that I saw it on my own. We don't any of us see anything on our own. We are led to see by the Spirit of God. And I was told about the idols in the Word of God, that the idols have eyes but they don't see, they have ears but they cannot hear, they have a mouth but they can't talk, they have feet but they can't walk, they have hands but they can't use those either. It was one way that God was trying to tell us that the thing that you're focusing on is dead. And whatever it is that you're focusing on that's getting all of your attention and your heart, by the way, is dead. And eventually you become like it. Well, how does that manifest in a person's life? To manifest the dead thing that they're focusing on. Much of what I would have to say about this, most people can't handle. I'm going to say it this way. A lot of what medical science registers as certain problems are actually the result of the person's heart. And I'm not talking about an emotional sickness here, I'm talking about a spiritual sickness, if you could call it that. It's actually a spiritual deviation toward the dark side, and it brings things with it. It opens the door so that what people then see is a truth in front of them, but they don't recognize it because it looks different, and they don't see the, uh, they don't see the similarity between what is in their heart and what is out there. They don't see it. We don't see it. It's very hard for us to see. Extremely hard. But God is perfect. And God is truth. Now His righteousness involves His justice and His mercy. It also involves His perfection and His truth, His balance, His harmony, His peace. So when we are outside of his law, then we will experience the events that come as a result of being outside of his law. You see, God's a lawless person, and you say, well, that's not me. A lawless person is outside of God's laws long before the laws of the land are being broken by that person. So God's laws are deeper. Jesus came bringing God's laws. What Jesus did was that He brought a concept of how much deeper God's laws are than what most people think God's laws are. So you break God's laws and the enemy is alerted immediately because now you've got the hounds of hell after you. Oh yeah, there are hounds of hell. And they know when there are open doors that they can enter because there are protections around the soul of a person that are intact as long as that individual does not break God's laws. Now Jesus came sharing God's laws. He said we were to practice forgiveness. He said a lot of, a lot of things. And we were not to step into evil we were not to do this. The whole way for him to get into us had to come by way of repentance from evil. And if you say you have no evil in you and no, no sin, no sin, then you lie. And in the book of John, we're taught to about this as well. I think it's in 1 John, I believe. 
the lawless. So Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery. He said, if you hate a brother, you've murdered him. It's murder. It's murder. Have you ever murdered? Well, and that, according to what Jesus has said murder is, I think most people have. God's lawfulness. God doesn't want you stepping over into that because those things attach you to a system that he is trying to separate us from. He separates us from that system to the kingdom of God. But this is a process. And the kingdom of God actually exists. It is a place. And you have to become separated from the kingdom of the world. Or, I should say, the kingdom of hell. In Matthew 4, starting about in verse 1, now I have talked about this many times, and just so you know, I'll be talking about it many times again. It's worthy of talking about many times. Then Jesus was led away by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This was horrible, by the way. And I know that I've talked about this before, but it can't go. You cannot not think about this. You have a holy, holy man. Full up with the Holy Spirit in the presence of something so evil. These are atmospheres. We're going beyond just two people, you know, having a conversation here. That isn't what this was. There are pressures from that atmosphere and the filth on that entity is unspeakable. You can't even describe it. But the atmosphere is so intense and our Lord is having to hold fast in that atmosphere, close to something that he's not supposed to be near to at all. But it was ordained that he endure this. This was not. a nothing. That stuff, being close to something like that, sucks the life out of you. It is. He was evil. He is evil in the presence of our Lord. There is a religion that claims that the devil and Jesus were brethren. That is also, that is a heresy. That's a lie. They are not. He was called the anointed cherub, the enemy was. And he was said to be perfect until he fell. But Jesus is not related to him at all, having never been an angel. I don't know how some of these heresies get off the ground. The Word of God is pretty clear. You have to, you have to be really ignorant of the Word of God to be able to believe these heresies. Don't believe what other people say. You get in there and read it for yourself. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, I've heard people say that the enemy came to him when he was at his weakest, and in many ways that's true. But I will say this, having been a student of fasting for some time over the years, <clears throat> to come to the end of a fast like this 
and to become hungry after 40 days. It's when the body begins to become catabolic. It's right when the body begins to digest its own muscle tissue. It's already digested all of its stores. Now, I couldn't last 40 days because I'm pretty small, but he was a full grown man and I'm certain his flesh was um, sufficient to go the 40 days. Your spirit, when you fast, is able to be extremely strong. The processes by which we digest food and whatnot take up an enormous amount of energy. But once you get into a fast, and I mean you're past all the hunger part and all of that, if you experience that at all, and you're truly in the fast, for those who can fast, and there's different ways of fasting, by the way, and don't go without water. I should probably do a quick review of this, and I'm just going to do a quick review. If you fast and you have no medical conditions that would say that you couldn't or shouldn't, in other words, no metabolic conditions like diabetes or those kinds of things, you're in good health, nothing wrong with you, you start with a 24-hour fast one day. And then you take as much time to recover from the fast as you did fast. In other words, the recovery from the fast should be on steamed, one of the best things would be steamed kale. And you eat the steamed kale for a day if you fasted a day. Okay? And with plenty of water. This is while you're coming off. All right? So coming off of the fast is as important as the fast. Now, if you fast 10 days, you would gradually give yourself about a week, eight to 10 days, probably a good week to come off the fast. With steamed vegetables, just a few meals every day, gradually adding a few more meals until finally you're able to take meat, which would be maybe around the third, maybe fourth day. All right, that's just an idea. Now, there are different people who teach fasting in different ways, like you shouldn't take anything, only water. I don't agree with that, only because I believe that the blood sugar issue is a deal, a big deal for a lot of people. So I tend to recommend uh, diluted, uh, gentle fruit juice, um, a natural fruit juice, one that's not acidic, and you dilute it half water. So you've got two ounces, two ounces is good. Uh, about every two or three hours you take about two ounces of fruit juice with two ounces of water. Okay, but you drink water throughout the day. Okay, lots of water. 40 days, 40 nights. He had nothing in the way in his digestive system or anything else keeping him from God the Father. Then he was hungry. This kind of hunger is ferocious. When the body begins to break down its own muscle tissue, it is ferocious. A craving, a scream on the inside of the body. That's when the tempter came to him. He's known by many words. They are all true. He's a tempter. He's a slanderer. He's a liar. He's a hater. He's a murderer. He's all these things. He is those things. So when you engage in any of those things, you are being partner with him. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus could have done it. And Jesus answered, It is written, He's holding 
fast to what he can stand on, the truth. The only thing that you can stand on is the truth. There's nothing else for you to stand with. A fight with the devil will take you out without God. If you don't have God, if you don't have his words, his, if you don't have God, the enemy will take you out. You are not a match for him. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now he says you'll live on it. He says it'll feed you, not just bread. He doesn't say that you don't need bread. He said that your life is in the word of God. You're going to live on that. Your body needs food and the word of God. Then the devil took him. He look at the permission that entity had to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. If you're the son of God, he says, throw yourself down. So he's like a dare ya, a double dog dare ya. Oh, come on, you can do that. That's not a problem. Just let your imagination soar. Whatever you decide, whatever you think of, you can do it. Just go ahead. Go ahead. Isn't that what the world's teaching everybody? Use this marvelous mechanism of thought that God gave you and just go for it. And do what? Get further and further and further and further into that world system so you can't hear God anymore. That's what it'll do. Disconnect you. And that's what the enemy's about. He says, I've got a plan to disconnect man. I'm going to do it through the lust of his body. I'm going to do it through the lust of his eyes. And I am going to get him to do stuff just because he can. Just because he can. I call this the sin of presumption. He says, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up on their hands so that you'll not strike your foot against a stone. See, the devil knows the word of God. Oh, yeah. You see, the word of God itself doesn't save you. It's the word of God you believe that saves you. Believing unto salvation. Jesus replied, it is written. You know, I love this because I'll use this often. Do you know Jesus didn't memorize chapter and verse? <laughs> I don't even think they had it then. I'm sure they didn't. I'm sure they didn't. But he doesn't quote. <clears throat> he doesn't quote where this is written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. It's enough that you know what the Word of God says and you believe it. That's enough. You don't have to have it entirely memorized as far as scripture and verse. It's helpful and useful for finding it again, but that's also what a concordance is for. So Jesus replied, it is written. It is also written. It is also written. Do not put the Lord of God Lord your God to the test, but see, the God was not the devil's. God, the devil was his own God. So one of the things the devil does is test God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. That had to be incredible. All this I will give you, he said, if you will fall down and worship me. The Lord's got him now. Away from me, Satan, Jesus declared, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
Then he, then the devil left him, and the angels came and ministered to him. And we know that they meant from Scripture that they ministered strength to him. Okay, because that situation, that thing that happened to him with regard to that evil entity sapped his strength. If you feel that second test I have been meditating on for some time now, the second one in Matthew, in um, Luke, I think it's the third test. So those two tests are, are flipped from one gospel to the next. They are both tremendously important. All three of them are vitally important. If you have the need to prove yourself, in any way. If you have the need for other people to uh, adore you and to... If you're seeking the favor that comes from people, and if that's where your attention is, then that test is the one that you have to really get into yourself. The test this is presumption because the enemy, the sin of presumption, because you'll be trying to prove yourself to people. And then the last one in Matthew here, having to do with worship, falling down and worshiping him. You see, ultimately doing what the devil wants you to do is worship. So any one of his failings on any of these tests would have put him in the category of worshiping the devil. It's just that the ante kept being upped because the Lord continued to refuse the temptation. So finally the devil brought him to a place where he showed him everything and said, well, what about this? You know, there's a saying that I've heard in the world called, every man has his price. Well, I believe that's true. I believe everybody does have their price. Just make sure that your price is the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that's your price. He'll pull you through any temptation that comes at you. He will pull you through any temptation that comes at you if you truly have him at your core and you learn to walk and depend. You learn to walk by him and depend on him. And you need him every day, many, many, many times during the day. Psalm 91 we're going to read that psalm where he got one of the scriptures. About the angels holding him up and not breaking any of his bones. Not a bone was broken in his body when he hung on the cross either. Even though they were breaking bones there toward the end. They didn't break his bones because they could see that he was already dead. I don't believe he was forced out of his body. I believe he left. It's different. There came a point where he left. I have believed that his... He was killed. Uh, that's something for another time. That's a speculation of my own. So I'll keep it to myself. Ch verse 1, <clears throat> Psalm 91, verse 1. He 
who dwells. This is, oh, by the way, this is an absolutely fabulous psalm to get into yourself for any kind of warfare that you have, any kind of difficulty. You have children going out into serve in the military, or you're going to serve out into the military yourself, you get this psalm into your heart and you keep it there. You recite this thing to yourself regularly. And you get this, these words into your heart. Years ago, I had heard a story about a general who apparently required in the Second World War, he was army, who required his troops, his particular group, to man, uh, memorize Psalm 91. And they had many miraculous events that came out of that particular group where these young men were saved. There was one story that someone told, and again, I'm hearing stories. This is rumor upon rumor. But it was a young man. It's a wonderful story, so I'm going to tell it anyway. A young man that was... I th perhaps in Germany, Second World War, but he's hearing the shelling going on and the building that he's in at the time because he's walking through comes under shelling. They're firing bombs at it, etc. There's a table in the room which he goes under to protect his head. The shelling continues, it's deafening, he protects himself under there as best he can, but it goes on for a long time. And that building came under attack and it was decimated. Well, after everything had quieted down and he poked his head out from under that table and the debris that was all around him, that table was the only thing standing in that building, it was the only thing left standing. <laughs> but he quoted Psalm 91, the entire time he was under that table, he was one of those generals, soldiers. <laughs> That's a wise general. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's his protection. I will say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Mean it. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly plague. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and rampart. This is God's righteousness, which includes his faithfulness. God's faithfulness. Praise you, Jesus. His righteousness includes his faithfulness. It includes his truth. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the calamity that destroys at noon. Though a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, no harm will come near you. You will only see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling, my refuge, the Most High. No evil will befall you. No plague will approach your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up on their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young, the young lion and the serpent. Because he loves me. Now this is God talking. The transition was made a few times here. This is God talking directly. Because he loves me, I will deliver him. Because he knows my name. I will protect him. When he calls out to me, I will answer him. 
I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Choice. Incredible. Job chapter 12. God is faithful and his words are true. That is truth. You get that into your heart, every word of it. You focus on it. You drink it in like it's food, because it is. And it will give life to your body. It will feed you. What Jesus said wasn't a lie, it was the truth. Man does not live by bread alone. You don't live by bread alone. Your body needs the bread, the physical bread. And everything else in you needs this. But this will also affect your body. And most of the things that it said in there had an application to your body. He'll keep you from evil. He'll keep you in health. He'll keep you. He'll protect you. It's going to look fierce. It's going to look nasty. But you stay right there with him. And he'll get you through. And then much to your surprise, at some point, you will notice that you're on the other side of the problem. <gasps> you're on the other side of the bad guy. <gasps> how did that happen? Hmm, let me see, because that's how he does. You take his word into your heart, and you believe on it, and he is going to act that word out in your life and you won't necessarily see the relationship but that's what will happen exactly what is in that word is going to happen in your life but you have to swallow it for real which means you have to get all of the interfering stuff out of there that will come against that word and we're told in the parable of the sower and the seed which we've talked about many times here that there are many things that will come in and interrupt that word. The cares of the world, if you allow them to dominate you. The lust of the flesh, well, we know that from the tests that our Lord went through. The food that you consume and allowing that to be your God. Having your belly be your God. That would be the same thing as saying, letting your emotions be your God letting your emotions guide you in all things, your base impulses being the voices that you listen to, that is not of God. Job Chapter 12. I think a lot of people don't quote Job because oh, that was really a rough tour of duty that Job was on. Well, I think most people have been through a rough tour of duty. And I have to find it's kind of, it's healing. You read God's rough tours of duty. Read the prophets. Read Job. Job. Prophesize. A lot of people don't think of Job as a prophet, but he was, and he is. He still is. That's the amazing thing about the old prophets. They still are prophesying. Job 12, 12. When you're going through something rough, reading the ones in the scripture who went through rough is very, very healthy. It, God talks to you through what they went through, and he'll minister to you. So you read the prophets and read Job and read David. Oh, David went through rough stuff. Job 12, 12. Wisdom is found with the elderly, and understanding comes with long life. Wisdom and strength belong to God. Counsel and understanding are his. Praise be to God.
fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So listen to this and understand it's the truth. What he tears down cannot be rebuilt. The man he imprisons cannot be released. If he holds back the waters, they dry up. And if he releases them, they overwhelm the land. True wisdom and power belong to him. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leads counselors away barefoot and makes fools of judges. You see, God is the unseen hand behind everything that's being done. Now we attribute the bad things to the devil and the good things to God. God is a good God, but he also created the one who destroys. Because ultimately, God's plan for good is deeper than you can comprehend. It's deeper than the comprehension of man will allow. So you have to understand that he already knows more about what he's up to than you can comprehend. You need to get on his side. And he will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. And he certainly can. He created it. And he did it for a reason. And it was to draw you to him. God is drawing all those who are his to him. You have to develop an ear to hear. And get past all of those emotions that the world uses to imprison you to the system of the world. You have to get rid of those things. And it's not easy in a heart where they've been allowed to run wild and you've become lawless. And you don't think you're lawless. But in any area where your heart is running wild and you're, you're thinking things and slandering and gossiping and doing other things that you ought not do, and you haven't gotten a hold of it because after all, what you're doing, you're not hurting anybody, you think, but you are. You're creating death. You're spinning death with your mouth and you're spinning death with your thoughts. Yes, your thoughts can be death spinners. They're not a nothing. So you want to get hold of those and you want to go before God with it because you can't do this. You need his help to get hold of this. And you keep putting it before God every time you catch yourself doing it. Catch yourself doing it. Take it before God. In a sense, you could look at it this way. You're getting control of a dog that's out of control. And that's basically what the flesh is. And yes, the flesh is in your head too. You've got to get hold of it. It's got to become trained to submit to the Word of God and to not run wild in lawlessness. This is not easy, but it has to be done. Because, as I said when we first started out here, Jesus paid the price, and we are the ones, the mechanisms by which this price, this beautiful thing that has been bought, is now going to be distributed, is being distributed by imperfect vessels. But we are the distributors of what God has given us by His Spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we have work to do in our own heart. So we're told here in Job 12, especially Job 12:12, 12, 12, that wisdom is found in the elderly and understanding comes with long life. Now this is only true if you're submitting to God. If you're not submitting to God, I've met a number of elderly people that didn't appear to have much wisdom because they had squandered away the opportunities 
that they had in life in order to spew the falseness, the deceptions, the lies of their own heart. They never conformed their heart to God. So they had no understanding to give. They were foolish people, sadly. They had a long time to become not foolish, but they never made the decision to become what God would have them be by embracing his ways and listening to his word. You choose. God says in Genesis, he says, I put you, I put you in this, I put before you life and death. Choose life. Choose life. I put before you good and evil, so choose good. Well, there is only one good, and that is God. So you have to choose him. Really choose him. Make him your best friend. He is your best friend. You make him your best friend. <laughs> Job. Job is absolutely great. Absolutely great. I, well, I would like to spend more time here, but... So spend more time there. You spend more time there. It's a good place to stay for a while. You can hardly believe the wisdom that comes out of the mouth of Job. The truth of it is, tremendous wisdom comes forth from the mouth of his friends. And yet they were deemed not to actually be his friends because they were trying to lord it over him. They weren't, you know, if one of them had come up to him and just said, Job, we're going to take you into our home. We're going to feed you. We're going to take care of you through this. That friend would have been a real friend. But these people didn't do this for him. They talked with him. They shared with him about God. But they didn't offer to him the love of God. That's what I saw. Now, he was supposed to, in the end, he's to pray for them so that God would forgive these men of their short fall with regard to Job. And Job does that. Anyway, Galatians 3, starting in verse 6. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, he didn't just go, you know, I believe God. He believed. That meant he was all in. That meant he had God with him all the time, in his heart, in his thought life. He was with God. And he believed that God would bless him in everything that he did. So when he went out with those kings from Sodom and wherever else, there were several kings, and they went out, and Abraham went with them because Lot, his nephew, had been taken captive. And so they went out to rescue him. So he goes out. They, they had a big fight, and, you know, Abraham brought all of his people, and these kings brought their people, and it was a big win. And he was entitled to a share of the spoil. And the kings offered it to him, and he said, No, lest any man say that he made me wealthy and not God. See, he knew God was his source. He knew it. So he could refuse the wealth of the world. Also, and this is an interesting point, he did not become a partaker in the wealth that was shared by those kings who were over those horrible cities. He became no partaker with them, no sharer of their goods. And that was important because later, when he needed to stand before God as an intercessor, clean, and put in a word for Lot's life and the family of Lot or whoever could get out with Lot, 
he was able to be heard and his word was able to be acted on. You see, this is all good. God is our source. And the more you believe it and the more you put it into practice and the deeper it goes, the more standing you have with God, the more powerful he is able to be for you, in you, through you, to a dying and lost world. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Starting in verse 6, Galatians 3. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are sons of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and foretold the gospel to Abraham. Now, Abraham was before Moses. We have to keep some of these timelines in our mind. This is before the law was given. All nations will be blessed through you. To those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I'm going to say something about certain countries in this world. There are some countries in this world that embraced the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ early on. And I'm going to use one of those nations. There were several, but I'm going to use just one. Well, I could use others too. England. Okay, she came to the Lord early, all right? She spread her wings as a young nation and reached out and reached out and reached out and reached out. Now she became chastised later, many years later, by other countries that rose up and decided to, well, you know, you're, you're just an empire maker and all of that. Okay, so maybe it was becoming time when she was supposed to stop that. Maybe her job was done. I don't know. But I look at all of the countries that she went into, and she made all of them better. They were all made better. She got their government set up. And you may not even know this, but, the, but, but Israel now was a recipient of her land having been watched over by England. She had to get through England to be able to get, and England was like prepared for her by God. So she was blessing nations in that way. It was a marvelous nation to study the history of with regard to that. And you can point out and criticize all of the bad stuff that she did and all the bad stuff the other nations did. Well, you know, is that really where you want your brain to lay? You know, you can follow the work of God through all of this, and that's more exciting. And God has worked through that great nation all these years, and she is being protected even now in ways that are awesome. England. <laughs> I just find her amazing. She's different. But they all, all of the ones that reached out in the power of God to bless other nations. The Spanish did it, reaching out to South America, Mexico, you know, just the form of government. They were seeding those places with the riches that they had to give. They were a blessing to those places. So it's important to take these things into account and realize that not everything that you're looking at you're actually seeing. Pay attention to what the power of God did through these countries and you'll begin to see things a little differently. I like to pay attention to Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Now that was an interesting thing. That's when Protestantism, for the truth, became a part of England, began to be. 
you see there's many reforms that began to take place in different parts of the country. And it's interesting, the people that brought them about aren't really hailed as heroes or heroines. But I believe Anne Boleyn was in that regard. And she championed the cause of Protestantism in England during a time when uh, the ferocity of the Catholic Church had uh, gone too far. It's all very good. You just take a look at what God is doing, and He is doing it, rolling on. Okay, the blessing, the blessing of God. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and foretold the gospel to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Well, if we are his children by faith, this is Abraham's blessing we're seeing acted out here. How about you take a look at that? And don't get into what the world is doing with putting down all of these great European nations and all. They were spearheaders, spearheaders for the power of God and what exactly we were told was going to happen. Blessing other nations with what they had to give the adventuresomeness that they all had going out and spreading seed, setting up missionaries to spread the word of God. Many of these missionaries did absolutely fantastic work bringing the, 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 what you would call the heathen to God. I know there are other people that like to say, well, they disrupted all those nations. Well, they sowed seed into those nations that helped those nations. They did other things too. You see, the whole thing is none of us are perfect. We aren't. And so when God fills you with his spirit to go do a task, you're going to bring you along. Now that's amazing. You're not just bringing God, you're bringing you. And whatever imperfect parts are part of you, they're going to be brought along too. So it's extremely important that we endeavor to do what God wants us to do to press down and have lay flat as much of that flesh as we can so that what shines forth and what is given to these other places is God through us. So the flesh needs to be pressed down. It Flesh needs to be subdued. But as long as we are here on this earth, we are still people and not perfect. We're not perfect according to the eyes of man, and we aren't perfect according to the eyes of God. We are in the process, but we need to have God shining through us as much as possible and keep that flesh down. Paul said, as I've also said many times, I buffet my flesh daily. Daily, I buffet my flesh. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So we are declared righteous by faith, righteous before God by faith. So all these nations that have been blessed by the faith of other individuals who have believed Jesus are also the sons of Abraham. It's amazing what God is doing. Utterly amazing. Exodus. So keep in mind that prior, and, and this goes all the way back, I don't have the list of it with me right now, but you will... I'm just going to say this flat out, and I'm not a... Pray for Israel. We're told in the scriptures that there's a great blessing if we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Israel. And she truly needs our prayers at this time. She truly does. That she do what God would have her do. Praise you, Lord that she not do more and she not do less than God would have her do. That she will hear the voice of her maker and with one accord and great strength 
She will take care of business, get the job done, and resist the voices outside of her to do otherwise, that she will do what she is supposed to do in Jesus' name, by the power of God. There are those who want to believe that that land that they are living in belonged to these people referred to now in this struggle that Israel is in. They never did. They never did. Prior to Israel being there, that land was held by England. It was never that land at no time in her history, and you can study this out if you have a mind to, that land was never a Palestinian state, ever. It went through many hands of control. Rome had it. The Persians had it. Israel had it. Israel was given it, but she was occupied by these other nations. But it was never not hers. That's important that you understand that by the scriptures. So, in solidarity to the truth, pray for Israel. Exodus chapter 23. starting about in verse 21. Ooh. Actually, starting about in verse 20 here. Behold, I'm sending an angel before you to protect you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. He could be saying this to any one of us right now. Pay attention to him and listen to his voice. Do not defy him, for he will not forgive rebellion, since my name is in him. Now there is such power of God in the people that God has invested with his name. Tremendous power. Pay attention to him and listen to his voice. Do not defy him, for he will not forgive rebellion since my name is in him. That's worthy of respect. Now this is a thing that this day and age we are not being taught. If you don't learn it from your family when you're little, you're not going to get it from the culture almost ever. And that is respect. But if you listen carefully to his voice and do everything I say, a willing and obedient heart, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will annihilate them. You know, that's a good word for anybody with enemies. The thing is, God will annihilate them his way. I've had him annihilate my enemies by moving me. <laughs> All of a sudden, I wasn't there one day. I was gone. All of my stuff was gone, and I was somewhere else. And where were my enemies? He's had me do that to get rid of enemies before. He's moved me into a better place. And my enemies, where were they? People will take an exception to you as a child of God for no other reason than the word of God in you. They will slander you, 
They will hate you. They will create problems. They will be treacherous to you for no other reason than the word of God in you. Verse 25. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take away sickness from among you. No woman in your land will miscarry or be barren. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn and run. I will send the hornet before you to drive the Hivites and Canaanites and Hittites out of your way. Funny that we don't have a legal service that has risen up somewhere in the Middle East or anywhere with a, uh, uh, some kind of a lawsuit for reparations for the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites. Odd, kind of peculiar that hasn't happened yet. Hmm. Well, moving on. I will not strive, I will not drive them out before you in a single year. These things that God does with us very often take a very long time. And I would say in Israel's acting out, and she is a prophetic nation. Those who say that prophecy doesn't exist anymore have not actually watched Israel carefully. Israel is acting out the prophecy of God even now. I will not drive them out before you in a single year. Otherwise, the land would become desolate and wild animals would multiply against you. Now, I've wondered about those wild animals. I've thought, what kind of wild animals is he talking about here? Lions and tigers and bears? You know what? Now, that's amazing. And that those wild animals would attack the people. Hmm makes you wonder what we've had victory over already because I don't believe these situations exist in most places in the world. I think India is having some issues with monkeys and a few other things. But yes, there are animals that will kill people. It ought not be. They're supposed to be afraid of men, but there are some that are emboldened and aren't. Little by little, I will drive them out ahead of you until you become fruitful and possess the land. Verse 31. And I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert to the Euphrates. Now the Gaza is the land of the Philistines, and she is bordered by a sea. I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert to the Euphrates, and I will gather the inhabitants into your hand and you will drive them out before you. You will make no covenant with them or with their gods. They must not remain in your land, lest they cause you to sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. All of these things require some thinking with God and a pause on what's happening now, currently, with regard to that great prophetic land, Israel. So she needs our prayers. We are not to bow down to false gods. We are not to serve them, and that means you are not to be a helper to wicked people. 
Now, there are many scriptures in the Bible that talk about the wicked and those who serve them. There are many wicked people who have servants, and many of those servants don't actually believe that they're wicked. They think they're really nice, but they're enamored with the wicked person. Maybe they're afraid of them. Who knows? But for whatever reason they serve that wicked person, that's an evil thing. And they are counting themselves as part and as one with God's wrath. And God talks about this because the helpers will not escape. No matter the reasons you think that you're helping someone wicked, if you're doing that, if you're helping wickedness, mm -mm, you don't escape God's wrath. We are not to do what they do. And that means don't spend time looking at what they do. There's a great deal of wickedness that's going on that's been copied for, in film in different places. And if you watch that stuff a lot, eventually you'll pick up its ways. You won't want to, but you will. Because what you watch again and again and again and again and again be begins, it will begin to be acted out in your life. You're giving it permission to come into your life by watching it. You're giving it permission to come into your heart by listening to it. So we have to stop giving evil permission. You cut it off at your eyes and you cut it off at your ears. I learned years ago that slander, you can't say to yourself, well, that person's a slanderer, and then let them come and talk all their slander to you because your hearing of it makes you a partner. So you would have to say to that person who slandered, I don't want any part of this. You can't be talking to me about that stuff. I don't want to hear it. Now, John the Baptist was privy to Herod's relationship with Her Her Herodias. I think that's how you say her name. But she actually was the wife of a, of a brother of his. And he had taken her for his own. John the Baptist rebuked it. He told him, no, no, and no. You can't do this. She's not yours to take. She doesn't belong to you. Now, it certainly got the attention of Herod. But he found John the Baptist a little interesting, somebody he wanted to keep close and just visit with because he did consider him a holy man. But he had one evil, evil relationship with that woman. And she was relentless until she got John the Baptist killed. Now that's not going to happen every time you rebuke evil. But within the heart of a truly evil person, the hatred against you for saying anything about the evil they indulge in or making it not okay for them to do it around you, it's going to have consequences often. So Psalm 91, you rebuke the evil before you, and you go to Psalm 91 and you speak God's protection over yourself and you keep yourself under the wing of his refuge. You keep yourself in his high tower. You keep your thought life there and he'll get you through it. But you will not be a partaker or a participant in that evil. You will have come against it and God will hold you blameless concerning it. Now you stand your ground. Psalm 91 is a great one. It's a great one. Our Lord used that to fight the devil, and so can you. Father, we have come before you today with hearts desiring to have you first Place. So, Lord, make it so. Help us to do that which we have a desire to do, 
but may not be strong enough to complete. We know you're faithful to complete the work that you've begun in each one of us. So Lord, we speak to that faithfulness now and we believe you for what you've said, that you'll complete the work that you've begun in us. Help us, Lord, do the thing that has been impressed upon our hearts to do today, to draw close to you, to let go of that which would hold us to the world, and to embrace the truth by which we can stand. And having done all to stand, therefore, stand. In Jesus' name, amen.